Hi guys, uh, we'll talk through chapter seven today, focusing in on landscape effects and population distribution and dynamics. Um, so let's review just a little bit about what a population is. I'm sure you guys have studied this at some point, but um, a population is a group of individuals of the same species living in the same geographic area. In the case of landscape ecology speak, we would say they live within the same patch. All populations um, tend to undergo some fluctuations or even a life cycle in a uh, time of of growth leveling off and then often extinction of the population. Um, and, you know, there's several factors that affect maintaining a viable population. And those include having adequate, adequate food supply, sufficient home sites, the ability to successfully reproduce. Um, all of these can mitigate the effects of dispersal immigration, climate, predation, disease, and parasites, which, which can all detract from the population. Um, some factors that, that limit populations are density dependent, and um, that effect varies according to the population density, and other factors are density independent. And we'll talk a little more later on in the lecture about some modeling of populations. But in general, it's enough to know that um, population size is, um, is added to by births and immigration and that we lose numbers in a population by deaths and immigration. It's also good to pause and think specifically about what are the factors that are going to affect uh, birth rate or fitness within a population. So that's the, the contribution to the next generation by any individual. Um, and it's usually achieved by, by the optimal com combination of four different variables. That is the age of reproduction, the fecundity or the number of young um, produced each year, the likelihood that those young will survive and the survival of the adult um, and how long they are reproductive. So in a healthy population, the birth rate will equal if not exceed the death rate. Um, and most populations will level off after the population reaches a certain size. And that's why when we might see an increase in immigration out to other patches in the landscape. Population number. So just to go a little deeper on that, um, climatic factors like rainfall, flooding, drought, and temperature often play a role in limiting population growth. Um, something like a fire or a volcano can drastically influence population size, obviously without, without regard for their density. Um, we may have a hard freeze that kills the buds of trees. Um, we might see one of those this weekend where I live. And then rainfall or the lack thereof can drastically affect um, the breeding capability of some, certain groups, such as amphibians and waterfowl. So all of those would be examples of density independent factors. Density dependent factors are factors that affect, um, whose effect usually vary directly with the density of the, of the population. So, as the population's density increases, obviously suitable home sites and food can become more scarce. At, um, as the rate of individual contacts increase, intraspecific aggression can increase. Females may stop breeding if the density gets too high. The rate of nestling um, with birds, young, 
um, being killed by their parents or another sibling might increase, and the rate at which juveniles are forced to disperse from an area may be greater. So all of those can be in response to, to the density of a population. Um, parasites may also increase and disease can spread more rapidly. So in some areas of the world, increasing wildlife populations are creating problems um, and they can spread communicable diseases. Um, and we've seen that in, with rabies and populations of skunks and raccoons and, and foxes. Um, so in those case, we have actually seen people intervening um, with, with birth control on wildlife populations to, to try to keep populations in check. So when we pause and think about populations, um, distributions through the lens of landscape ecology, um, a lot of this still builds upon the notions of, um, of the island biogeography theory and uh, metapopulation theory, which you guys wrote about in your midterms. Um, so some of the things that we strive to understand is what aspects of population structure in terms of amount, quality, or configuration are contributing most to the population decline, um, what landscape management practices would be most likely to affect recovery of populations. And we also strive to understand populations um, for developing conservation strategies of priority species and for managing invasive species and for managing game species. So we've talked a little bit about the difference between habitat loss and fragmentation earlier on this semester, but I think it's good to revisit this, um, this concept in regards to populations. So we know that those two terms are not synonymous. Habitat loss is the action on habitat that results in the reduction in the total amount of habitat available. Um, and so although habitats become fragmented by the process of habitat loss, when we are striving to understand the effects of fra fragmentation, we really want to isolate that to understanding the impact of the spatial pattern of that loss. And so when we think about impacts of fragmentation, um, we are specifically trying to, to zero in on um, configuration of loss, less so than the total amount of habitat loss. So there are four um, main effects of habitat loss versus fragmentation. And this, this um, figure helps us start to look at that. So we know a reduction in the total amount of habitat and landscape. Um, we often see an increase in the total number of remaining habitat patches. We may see a decrease in the size of the remaining habitat patches, and we may see an increase in patch isolation. And so one of the things that um, we've seen written about a good, a good bit is this concept of edge effects. And we talked about this as well um, at the beginning of the semester. So when we think about edge effects, there are also certain terms that we might see relating to types of species that either persist or thrive at the edge or those that, um, that actually do not. So the concept of an interior species is a species that is area sensitive. Um, they may require large blocks of unfragmented habitat at a landscape scale 
Um, these species could be early successional or they could be forest interior. So um, they're most likely to exhibit a positive patch relationship and they may be sensitive to edge effects. Edge species, on the other hand, are species that occur primarily or thrive within the zone known as the edge. Um, and they are expected to be negatively associated with patch size. So they actually thrive in a more patchy environment where there's more edge. Um, and we refer to those to natural edges or natural transitions between two habitat types as ecotones. So that's a, a zone or a junction, a transition area between two diverse ecosystems. Um, and so some of the examples that we see for an ecotone are, are mangrove or um, salt marsh with the transition between water and land in the coastal environment. Some of the edge effects, and again, we've, we've touched on this before, um, that we see are, you know, the higher the interior to edge ratio, the less patch border you have, um, and that increases, decreases the amount of interaction with the surrounding matrix. So a higher interior to edge ratio, so one with larger patches, um, decreases the probability of barriers that could limit movement of organisms. It decreases the probability of habitat diversity within the patch, um, which would not necessarily be harmful because it would be natural. Um, it decreases the importance of corridors for species movement if we have larger patches where um, animals can move freely within it and it increases the species diversity and the total number of animals within the patch. And this um, relates to island biogeography theory as well. So the book has this nice gra graphic that captures um, for the Amazonian rainforest some of those effects that we might see more at the edge of a, a forested patch. And so you can spend a few minutes um, looking at that. Um, so species distribution patterns and um, resource select functions. We know that species habitat relationships are among the most fundamental of all ecological relationships and are um, now often represented by an array of modeling approaches. So the resource select function models, um, they, model it, they model the relative use of habitat and expected distribution of species across a landscape. So they relate patterns of species occurrence to measured attributes of that landscape and then assign a probability of use. This often relies on presence absence data to define and then model what the quote use areas are. And we know that there are a host of issues um, surrounding the use of presence and absence data. We know that species may be present in marginal habitats. So even though they're present, we should not assume that that means that habitat is high quality. We also know that absences may just have been missed um, organisms that were not picked up by our survey, survey techniques. Species may not occupy all available suitable habitats, so their absence does not necessarily mean that, um, that, that that habitat is not high quality. And um, so to assess availability to attract individual we must define what is available based on on what we know about how those how those individuals move we have to base it on their dispersal range or their home home range size um, and habitat use may be time dependent based on annual differences and how uh, organisms move around um, what resources are available and so in that case you might actually need to to analyze based on seasonality as well 
So one of the things that the book gets into is the concept of the fundamental versus the realized niche of organisms. Um, so there may be a difference between an organism's fundamental and realized niche. The fundamental niche is its potential ability to utilize a certain area or certain resources, and the re realized niche niches the resources that it actually uses in a particular community. Um, so the example here with these two annals is that the Carolina and the Cuban annals occupy similar niches. They overlap in the height above the uh, ground that they'll occupy in trees where they live apart. And when the Cuban annual was introduced to Florida, it displaced the Carolina annual closer to the ground. And so when they coexist, their realized niches are different and more narrow than their fundamental niches are. So another species distri distribution um, modeling technique we see is the ecological niche model. Um, this uses a various techniques that relate to the species occurrence um, and it relates that to ecological climatic or environmental factors in an effort to actually define the species ecological niche and if we build an e and m it's then um, can be projected into the same or different landscapes to identify areas that meet that species needs. So in a way producing um, a, or shedding light on what might be the fundamental niche of that organism, which could then be paired with occurrence data to shed a more, little more light on what is actually the realized niche of that animal. Um, the book gave a great example, and I think I'll post this this week of uh, ecological niche model that was built based on Sasquatch sightings. Um, so sort of a, a funny but um, interesting read on how that model works even with a hypothetical um, organism. So again, in this case, there's some complicating factors with the use of presence and absence data. Um, that's possible to use presence only data in building these these types of species distribution patterns but we have to take a lot of care in evaluating the quality of that data and interpreting the model results the thing um, to keep in mind with some of the presence only data that's collected such as citizen science databases that take advantage of haphazard or random sightings um, is that often that data tells us as much about where um, where the species are as where the people are and are confounded in that way um, because they are often not based on a standardized survey technique. So we also need sufficient data to train these models. Um, so quite a bit of data is needed to develop a robust model, but there can be a point of diminishing returns on um, the amount of data that we plug in. So if we overfit models, we may actually drive them to be too specific. Um, and we referred that to as to a prediction. We refer to that as prediction bias. Um, and then there are questions about transferability. So can we really forecast species distributions um, or look into the future? and transfer models, different landscapes. Um, so there's often a trade-off between model um, generality to increase its extrapolation and interpolation um, when we really want to understand more accurately in this given landscape what the, what the realized or fundamental niche might be. Um, so one of the examples in the book was the realized versus potential distribution of four European tree species. Um, climatic models can be used to predict the potential distribution, uh, which is here in the shaded areas, for different species based, based on just their physiological thresholds. So it um, could be based on temperature and drought tolerance, 
And in this map, we see that the current distribution is shown in black points, um, and it may be limited because of dispersal constraints. So for some of these species, it appears that their realized um, distribution is much smaller than their potential distribution. And that might just be based on this um, glacial retreat expansion of those species. And over time, they may grow um, through dispersal to, to reach more areas within their potential range. Um, just some more basics on um, population growth models. The book gets into quite a few of these, but they really are relatively simple if you spend a few minutes with them. As we said before, populations are um, can be followed <laughs> relatively easily by looking at birth and um, immigration rates versus death and immigration rates, and those two together will equal change in population size over time. So we can, we can study the intri intrinsic rate of population increase. So that's the difference between birth and death rates. Um, that gives us an R factor. So an R of 0.1 would mean that a population is increasing at a rate at about 10% per year. If we want to predict how large a population would be over 10 years, given a, a rate of R equals 0 0.1, and starting with a population of 100 individuals, we can calculate that. And sorry, that should have been 0 um, 0.1. I just wanted to revisit the concept of, um, of different life life strategies. This is two examples of birds that will give you a sense of just how different those birth rates might look um, for, a different, for a given species. So we know that albatross are um, a long-lived species. They have a moderate rate of survival prior to breeding. The age of reproduction is late. They don't start breeding until they're eight or ten years of age and their fecundity is relatively low. They only raise through a, a good amount of parental care, um, 0.2 young per year. And the adult mortality, mortality rate is low. So these, these, um, these birds will continue to reproduce for many, many years with such a low annual mortality rate. Ducks, on the other hand, um, have relatively low survivorship before breeding. They, they breed early at one year. They have a high fecundity rate of three um, young per year, but then a high annual um, adult death mortality. So two different life strategies that at the end of the day might actually reap about the same fitness um, for these two really different organisms. Um, this chapter returned to the discussion of source seat dynamics. And so if we think in terms of the um, BIDE factors, then populations with high quality habitat should have a higher birth rate than death rate, resulting in positive population growth. And um, this we expect higher quality habitats to be population sources, while low quality habitats may be population sinks. And a UGA professor um, at the Institute of Ecology, Ron Pulliam, formalized this theory based on the relative assessment of bide rates and different habitat types. So in theory, population sinks are not intrinsically viable, but they persist over time because of immigration from source habitats. Um, but note, there has been a general practice of defining population sources and sinks solely on um, reproduction and survivorship, which ignores the relative contribution of immigration and immigration to the equation. It's harder to study um, 
to study that kind of movement. And um, a lot of times that gets left out of the analysis. Incorrectly so. Um, the book discusses some, some classic metapopulation meta models. One of the first of these, a guy named Richard Levins, wrote a classic paper on crop planting strategies as a mean of, means of controlling pest outbreaks. So his model concluded that plantings and harvests um, of all crop patches simultaneously would lead to the least crop damage over time because there would be no refugia where pest populations could escape and um, later recolonize. Um, so these kind of models can help us kind of envision and predict for landscapes um, that have a secure core population area, which serves as a perennial source of colonists for, for other smaller patches surrounding it. There's a great example um, of the endangered bay checkers fat butterfly in the San Francisco Bay Area where a single population served as the source population. And there are many smaller subpopulations or islands surrounding that, that source that would periodically go extinct because of factors like drought and then um, recolonize from that, that larger source population. So um, this model was spatially implicit because the specific size and the location and the configuration of patches was ignored and not explicitly considered. So it was just a population model. Um, incident function models, the book goes into again in some detail. So we can include the effect of spatial structure um, and on colonization and extinction dynamics using incident function models. So in this case, we might focus on occupancy of a single patch, um, which is likely to be affected by occupancy of surrounding patches, which in turn, it's based on its relative size and proximity to those patches. So this is an example of a spatially explicit population model. Um, and generally, information on the size and locations of patches is easy through GIS now for us to, to get and describe, but it also requires um, really high quality empirical information on occupancy, so that presence absence data and an understanding of the dispersal range of the species that we're studying. So it's, it's, for this sort of analysis, it's best for us to have data from several years of surveys. And um, the system of patches needs to be sufficiently large, um, maybe as many as, as 30 patches included in this analysis. This figure just gives us a snapshot of some of the different models discussed in this chapter. Um, from those non-spatial models that are really just basic demographic descriptions or models that you assume a homogeneous landscape to the more complex models and especially as we move into the spatially explicit models that um, were discussed in the latter part of the book. Um, so we go into a good bit of detail on um, some of the insights and in modeling extinction thresholds. Um, one of the things that the book notes that we need to keep at the top of our mind is that bigger isn't always better. So just as we discuss with large populations and that we should not assume that they are healthy source populations, we should not assume that a large habitat area or a large patch are functioning as sources just based on um, the size of, of that patch. So the book gave a great example of the impacts of, um, of cattle grazing in a large patch for a fritillary species um, where they found that 
much smaller, higher quality habitat patches were more likely um, to serve as sources in ungrazed areas than the larger grazed habitat patch. Um, the book also goes into a lot of detail on extinction thresholds and explores how much and what quality of habitat is sufficient to maintain viable populations. So an important metric in calculating extinction thresholds is the demographic potential of the species. Um, so this is a composite parameter. It consists of information on the species, reproduction, and dispersal abilities. Um, species with low demographic potential and with low reproductive rates and are, are with low reproductive rates and poor dispersal abilities will be more sensitive to habitat loss than those with the opposite. So models such as um, the one described by Wythe and Kings in the book can explore the effect of fragmentation on extinction thresholds. They had some really interesting modeling that revealed that clumped distributions of habitat, so larger patches of unfragmented habitat, um, showed far greater persistence than the same total amount of habitat area, um, but in a more fragmented configuration. So in this case, the, the difference uh, was 37%, which is pretty fascinating to read up on that. Um, there are a few other insights that the book that the book discussed. Um, one, Kamer, a 2000 study demonstrated that extinction thresholds can depend on the interaction between three variables: the amount of habitat in the landscape, the rate of change in that amount of habitat, and the life history of the species being studied. Um, the really important factor to acknowledge here is that rate of change might not be considered. We might, um, when we're doing these types of analyses, and it might be an all impact, an all important factor in the persistence of the species. Um, so, in highly dynamic landscapes, extinction is found to be more affected by the rate of change than the amount of habitat destroyed, even. And the actual impact of fragmentation has been difficult to demonstrate empirically. Um, so even though we have just a huge amount of information and theory on edge effects and, um, and fragmentation effects, it, we really don't always see that playing out in the literature empirically. But one of the, the takeaways from a literature review um, is that the the effects of fragmentation may really come into play as the total amount of habitat starts to decrease. So once we reach about only 30% of the habitat remaining in a landscape, we might start to see precipitous impacts of that fragmentation. Um, this figure sort of defines how, how we might look at um, extinction thresholds or ecological thresholds, how they may manifest. Um, the, the first is an abrupt decline um, at some critical level of habitat. We see that decline happening at the dash red line. This is more of a theoretical than an actual. We don't generally see um, thresholds occurring this way. What we're more likely to see is, is what we see in figure B here, where we see a more curved line or gradual decline in um, ecological response or species abundance with a loss of habitat. And so in this case, there could be some debate about what point of this curve we call threshold. And the general consensus is it might be best just to look at a range um, and to identify the, the point uh, along the curve where the change is happening most quickly and, um, and look at that range for our threshold. And then we can also look at categorical responses um, in which the response is significantly lower between some habitat level and, and we can configure our data this way.
Um, so finally, the one of the last types of models that the book talked about is spatially explicit population simulations. Um, in these types of models, the, the population is coupled with a landscape map. Um, this is often grid-based. We'd have cells where we characterize the habitat type, um, and we may have other attributes in there pertaining to the habitat quality, things such as stand age or fire history. And then the simulator will um, predict based on what we know about the organism interest that we're studying based on dispersal and reproduction and where mortality might occur. Um, it will predict the, our population within that landscape. So simulation models, um, they may model individuals following the, bi the BIOD factors and they may, or they can be population based. So the landscape can be theoretical, um, such as a neutral landscape model, or it, um, or it can be real. Um, it can also be simulated to reflect different management scenarios and how populations might respond to that. So the book gives a nice example from Australia with the uh, lead beater possum in the picture on the right, which was um, being driven to extinct extinction by all growth habitat loss. And um, through a simulation model, they helped to define management guidelines and a pattern of forest reserves that might help to prevent extinction um, of the species. So um, we know that population models are indispensable tools, um, but we need to, to heed um, some advice. So one is that we need to evaluate the relative rather than the absolute rates of extinction. Um, we need to use short time periods for making population projections and not try to project far out into the future. We need to start with simple models and choose a support that the data, uh, choose an approach that data can support. And we should always use models cautiously um, to diagnose cause and decline and potential recovery. So um, there is a general consensus of um, the keep it simple, stupid, or Occam's razor with modeling, where some of the greatest strengths of models are in their simplicity. Um, there are a few other insights on this slide that you guys can read through, but, um, but that wraps it up for chapter seven.